Good morning again. Simin Davudin is Professor of Environmental Policy and Planning at School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape and Associate Director of the Institute for Sustainability at Newcastle University. She is past President of the Association of European Schools of Planning, IASOP. Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She has led the UK Office of Deputy Prime Minister Planning Research Network, was a member of expert panels for three UK government departments, two EU Directorate, Directorate Generals, the ECRSC Grant Assessment Plan Panel, Research Excellent Framework and several European Research Councils held visiting professorship and different universities, uh, universities of Netherlands, Sweden, USA and Australia. is co-editor of the Journal of Environment, Planning and Management. Good morning, everybody. And can I just start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, fantastic symposium and to be in the beautiful city of Lisbon. Um, I'm going to start by, let me just bring the PowerPoint up. There we are. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with saying what is almost an obvious statement that we live in challenging times when we are constantly reminded of the unpredictability of what might be lurking around the corner, be it catastrophic climate change, terrorist attacks, banking crisis, or even urban riots. Among the various sort of remedies for governing such a state of flux, resilience has become, an, has actually achieved a remarkable discursive currency and has become almost the buzzword of our time. In fact, resilience seems to be replacing sustainability as the new catch-all concept. But what does resilience mean? Where has it come from? Does its ambiguity mean that resilience is just an empty signifier that can be filled by different things, with different things by different people? And is there a danger that policies and practices that are otherwise indefensible are being justified in the name of resilience. I'm going to address these questions by firstly unpacking three distinct meanings of resilience. I will then outline some of the political and normative implications of translating resilience from its ecological origin to the social domain I will then finish by arguing that it is the ideological fit between resilience and neoliberal mentalities that has made public policy, at least in the UK, so highly receptive to the concept of resilience. So starting with the different meanings of it. Resilience comes from the Latin root, resilire, which literally means to snap back. It was first used by physical scientists and engineers to define stability and resistance to external shocks. In the 1960s, it entered the field of ecology through the pioneering work of a Canadian ecologist called Buzz Holling who radically changed the classical systems theory of ecological systems. In a seminal article in 1973, he made a distinction between engineering and ecological resilience. 
He defined engineering resilience as the ability of a system to return to equilibrium after a disturbance. So the resistance to disturbance and the speed by which the system snaps back are the measures of resilience in this perspective. The faster the system bounces back, the more resilient it is. This engineering understanding of resilience is rooted in the Newtonian view of the world as an orderly mechanical device, a giant clock, if you like, whose behavior could be explained and controlled by mathematical rules and also kept in order by command and control. As you can see in these examples, the equilibrium perspective on resilience has influenced a wide range of disciplines, including psychology, disaster studies, economic geography, planning, climate change, and public policy discourse. In urban planning, the quest for a spatial equilibrium has a long and enduring legacy, which goes back to the modernist vision of a good city. A classic example is the Charter of Athens, a modernist manifesto, which portrayed a good city as a city in a state of equilibrium amongst all its respective functions. Le Corbusier, a key um, author, a lead author of the Charter, famously suggested that such a steady state could be achieved by the commanding power of plan. And similar aspirations underpinned Kristaller's central place theory and its neatly nested hierarchy of service centers. It is this engineering take on resilience with its emphasis on bouncing back that is gaining a growing currency in public policy discourse. As you can see from some of these statements that I've picked up from official documents in the UK. The preferred option is always to return back to a predefined normal without questioning the desirability of the normal or considering the possibility of a new normal. Radical transformation is considered not as a considerable not as a desirable outcome, but as a system failure. In the urban and regional context, this perspective is leading to new forms of resilient urbanism, which de whose defining characteristic is not long-term adaptive capacity building, but rather short-term emergency responses. Disturbances such as climate change events or the youth riot that I mentioned earlier are portrayed as abnormal and sudden shocks which challenge the global order of which these events are seen as exceptions rather than outcomes. In this ensuing state of emergency, the need for urgent action often forecloses a proper political framing, overrides the, de the demand for inclusivity, renounces or displaces social conflicts, and ostracizes the arenas in which questions about justice, fairness, and conflicts can be raised. So the race to resilient city status, which is now becoming even, is more accelerated after the Rockefeller's foundations of on 100 resilient cities, is therefore infused with profound distributive, environmental, and democratic implications, such as the creation of safe havens of segregated resilience in some cities. In his 1973 article, Holling provided an alternative ecological definition of resilience, which puts the emphasis 
on the magnitude of the disturbances that can be absorbed before the system changes its structure and functions. So here, the measure of resilience is not just how long it takes for the system to bounce back, but also how much disturbance it can take and it stays within critical thresholds. The significance of Holling's work lies in his departure from Newtonian view of the world and the, mechani the, the mechanistic assertion of equilibrium that were very much typical of the post-war systems theory. Instead, he replaced the complexity science, he, he adopted the complexity science in the field of ecology. So ecological resilience considers the world as complex, uncertain, and inherently unpredictable. The emphasis here is on not only the epistemic limits but also the logical impossibility of knowing the unknowns. This unknowability of the unknowns calls for a qualitative capacity to devise systems that can absorb and accommodate future events in whatever unexpected form they may take. In his later work, Holling and his fellow ecologists in Resilience Alliance expanded the resilience thinking beyond ecology and into the realm of society. They began to advocate a total complex system in which resilience is integral to the co-evolution of societies and ecosystems. And to mark this, this shift, they use the term socio-ecological, or as I've called it, evolutionary resilience. Evolutionary resilience challenges notions of order, status, stasis, and equilibrium. It considers complex systems as nonlinear, self-organizing, and permeated by discontinuity and uncertainty. The word self-organizing here is important, and I'm gonna come back to this later on. It suggests that in complex systems, unpredictable shifts can happen with or without external disturbance, and with or without any linear cause and effect. It sets the resilience of the system in the context of the evolution of the system itself. In this perspective, resilience is not necessarily about a return to normality, but about the ability of systems to change, to adapt, and crucially, to transform in response to crisis and stresses. It's about the ability to create untried beginning from which a new trajectory can evolve. It's about breaking away from undesirable normal. In the evolutionary resilience, resilience is not considered as a fixed asset or a trait, but a continually changing process. It's not a being, but a becoming. It may emerge when systems are confronted with disturbance and stress. So in the social context, this implies that people may become resilient, not in spite of adversities, but because of it, as is put so eloquently by Hemingway. As I mentioned, the Resilience Alliance is now advocating the use of evolutionary resilience, not only in ecosystems, but also as a general systems theory that can integrate society, economy, and ecology into a total 
complex system. They suggest that this totality can be approached heuristically as a nonlinear iteration of an adaptive cycle with four distinct phases, growth, conservation, creative destruction, and reorganization. So the first loop of the cycle relates to emergence, development, and stabilization of a particular pathway. And then the second loop relates to its rigidification and decline, while at the same time signaling the opening up of unpredictable possibilities or a spontaneous reorganization which may lead to a new growth path. In other words, as systems mature, their resistance reduces and they become an accident waiting to happen. And when systems collapse, a window of opportunity opens up for alternative pathways. This disruptive phase is therefore a time of greatest uncertainty, yet high resilience. It's a time of innovation and transformation when, it's, when a crisis can be turned into an, op an op opportunity. In this panarchy model, is the word used by ecologists, systems function in a, system, in a series of nested adaptive cycles that interact at multiple scales, multiple speeds, and multiple time frames. So small changes can amplify and cascade into a regime shift, while large interventions may have little or no effects. This means that past behavior of a system is no longer a reliable predictor of its future behavior, even when circumstances are similar. Evolutionary resilience is a great step forward in systems thinking. It's a reflection of a paradigm shift in science where nothing is certain except uncertainty itself. However, when resilience is applied to the social context, it becomes conceptually problematic and normatively contested. It is conceptually problematic because although both ecological and social systems are complex, their feedback processes are different. In the social systems, people's responses to events are triggered not just by structural forces and variables, but also by their agency and intentions. They consciously and intentionally take action, both individually and collectively. So forests cannot stop fire, humans can. But the adaptive cycle that I mentioned is overly deterministic. It doesn't allow for human action to break the cycles through their ingenuity, technology, and foresight. Ecologists themselves acknowledge these differences, and they suggest that in the social context, adaptive cycles and their outcomes are mere tendencies, not inevitabilities. Human agency is manifested in many ways in our both our individual and collective responses to crisis. And here are just four such manifestations, which I'm going to elaborate a little bit in turn. And in doing that, I'm going to highlight some of the political and normative questions that arise from them. I hope the minister excuses me <laughs> for doing that. So first, through our actions, we can displace the effects of a crisis 
in both time and space. This means that greater disturbances can be imposed on people elsewhere or in another time in the future. And a good example of such spatial and temporal displacements is the way we have responded to climate change so far. Because the impact of carbon emissions by the developed countries are felt more severely in the developing world and will have greater impact on future generations. Secondly, human agency is unequally distributed. The exercise of power and privilege has enabled extraordinary concentration of control over resources and rights, and this has in turn can block feedback mechanisms. So unequal access to democratic processes stops local knowledge to be fed back into the system and enable learning. In ecological literature, resilience is often presented as a neutral concept, partly because ecologists often subscribe to the idea that in nature there are no rewards or punishment, just consequences. Well, this may be true, but in society, unequal distribution of human agency means that there are always rewards and punishments. Some people gain, others lose in resilience, in the process of resilience building. Power and politics also influence how resilience and its desired outcomes are defined. In ecological literature, the desirable outcome is sustainability and is often defined uncritically. In the social context, defining what constitutes resilience and what is the desirable outcome always carry normative judgments, and it varies in different contexts for different people. For example, it's not immediately clear whether social conformity is a desirable or natural outcome of resilience. Whether people who can live on one dollar a day resilient or vulnerable. Whether refugees who flee from war zones are the embodiment of resilience or vulnerability. Whether all, all resilience, good resilience. One of the most resilient institutions are mafia and the, lo local, and the global drug trade. Another area which is influenced by power and politics is systems boundary. Defining where to draw the boundaries of a given system in time and space inevitably leads to the inclusion of some people and places and exclusion of others from the resilience of the system. Boundary definition is therefore a contested process that raises further normative questions. In the urban and environmental planning context, for example, we frequently make decisions about what part of the city should be protected from, for example, flooding, and what part may be, indisp may be dispensable. So as a result, some people find themselves on the, right, on the wrong side of the dikes or the levees. In the global geopolitical context, we even make decisions about whose life should be protected and whose can be considered as collateral. So boundary definitions such as these are rarely technical exercises. They are deeply colored by value judgments and often influenced by those with greater voice and better access to resources. The third manifestation of human agency is our ability to imagine and to anticipate. Imagination is the source of creativity. It can shape the path of social evolution. Through our cognitive and technological capabilities, we can anticipate. We can perceive changes 
at a larger scale and longer term than our sensory abilities and immediate experiences allow. We can recognize risks before they actually manifest. And we have the potential to take um, conscious and transformative actions to reduce these risks. In other words, we can diminish, sustain, or enhance resilience by being prepared. So although radical uncertainty and inherent unpredictability are the defining characteristics of our time, this doesn't mean the death of anticipation, preparedness, imagination, and planning. Finally, we can enhance our human agency and all the capabilities that I mentioned through coordinated collective action. And we can shape the trajectory of societal adaptation and transformation. But in ecological um, resilience, there is little room for goal-oriented action. Instead, great emphasis is put on the principle of self-organization, which I mentioned earlier. And then, in the social context, this self-organization is often misguidedly translated into self-reliance. Self-reliance puts the emphasis on individuals rather than society as a whole. And also, it calls for the retreat of the state. It implies that to be resilient, people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps and reinvent themselves in the face of external challenges. It suggests that people should relinquish any expectations of support on the basis that greater government support leads to erosion of resilience. And you can see that from some of these extracts from official documents. Self-reliance resonates closely with neoliberal mentalities and their emphasis on individualization of responsibility and rolling back of welfare state. So I would argue that it is this ideological fit which has made public policy so receptive to the concept of resilience. But the match between the two is not superficial or accidental. Because interestingly, the same time when Fred, the same time when Buzz Holling was developing his work on resilience in 1970s, Friedrich Hayek, a key architect of neoliberalism, was working on his theory of a spontaneous order. And according to that theory, social order emerges from the interaction of self-serving individuals who use the price systems to adjust their plans. So ideally, there should be no need for the state to regulate social interactions or maintain social order. Like Holling, Hayek also drew on complexity theory in order to criticize what he called the state-engineered equilibra of Keynesian demand management. And he wrote, social systems are like biological systems, newly defined by scientists as complex, adaptive, and nonlinear. So he called for a reform of all social institutions in accordance with the self-organizing dynamics of the market. The overemphasis on self-reliance in resilience discourse overlaps with the liberal view of society as the sum of the individuals. As you can see, Noberto Bobbio put it very nicely here, saying that liberal individualism amputates the individual from the organic body plunges him into the unknown for a struggle for survival. So resilience risks becoming a measure of the fitness of people and places to survive in the turbulent world. It risks reiterating the Darwinian law 
of natural selection and survival of the fittest. Under the welfare state, social policy aims to create what Anthony Giddens calls a sense of ontological security, whereby citizens expect the state to support them in times of adversity and hardship. Under the self-reliance resilience mantra, people are expected to look after themselves and take on greater responsibility for themselves. They're expected to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders and become responsible for themselves as a way of being. So resilience risk becoming a new existential yardstick of the responsibilized self. In some ways, it redraws the boundaries of citizenship. So to be a good citizen, one has to measure up to some predefined notion of resilience. This co-option of resilience discourse from ecology to society and its overemphasis on self-reliance, in fact, re reinforces this individualization of responsibility. It legitimizes the withdrawal of the state, support for um, vulnerable communities. It amplifies the reductionist neoliberal mentalities, which basically disparages the effectiveness of any kind of public sector intervention. And it celebrates not only the efficiency of the market, but its morality. So it's not surprising why resilience has managed to colonize so many aspects of public policy, at least in the UK, in such a short period of time. And furthermore, the, the dominance of the, it's a, a rather paradoxical actually, the dominance of engineering resilience and its emphasis on bouncing back means that complexity and uncertainty are often used to maintain or return to the status quo. But if there is one lesson to be learned from resilience thinking, is that uncertainty opens up transformative opportunities for breaking away from undesirable normal and for abandoning formulaic resilience engineering, which stifles creativity and novelty. But how we actually seize such opportunities and to what end we, act, we use them, of course, depends on our value choices, which can be anywhere on a continuum between the two extremes. At one end is neoliberalization, social Darwinism, atomization and competition, and at the other end is social democracy, justice, collective responsibility, and solidarity. But if there is one thing which is certain is that resilience is never a value-free, universal, and natural goal. It's always charged with normative questions such as resilience from what to what, resilience for whom, and who gets to decide. Thank you very much. Actually, President of the Foundation for Science and Technology, the public agency that founds scientific sector in Portugal, full professor at Instituto Superior Técnico of Universidade de Lisboa, where he was co-founder and president of the Scientific Council of the IN Plus Center for Innovation, Technology and Policy Research. He is the national director of the MIT, the MIT Portugal program, the major international partnership of science and technology in Portugal, and the field in the field of engineering system. He is also the Portuguese representative at the steering group of the European Strategic Energy Technology Plan and the director of the Energy Technologies Competi Competitiveness Cluster in Portugal, Paul Fran.
you. Thank you, first of all, very much for inviting, inviting me to this session. And um, of course, it is a privilege to be here at IGOT with all of you. It is certainly a, pre a privilege and a challenge uh, to speak after uh, Professor Davudi. Uh, but of course, I will start by using, uh, I believe, her words in saying that uh, sustainable urbanism is for sure requires a systems perspective which integrates uh, the environment, the society, and the economy. And the, what I would like to take you through is very clearly a practitioner's view. So after this wonderful uh, construction of the, um, well, the intellectual framework on sustainable urbanism, so I will be certainly today the practitioner guy, and a practitioner journey making use of what I will call urban metabolism framework, which in fact tries to articulate something which I believe is very important and for example which I am now working in the United States in the National Academy of Science on a committee on urban sustainability on a publication that will come later this year which clearly says that if we want to have sustainable urbanism for sure there is nothing only in the urban system we need to look at the global system and of course this is a very very key issue for what I'm going to tell now so um, let's see if I can understand how this works, certainly not this button, this one, yeah. So I will need to be fast to recover some of the time that we are uh, losing. I will not speak anything about this. About this I will say that, uh, of course, if we look at environmental impact, the problem that we have adding is there's a very, very simple equation which some people call the IPAT, which means that impacts are, of course, driven by the growth of population uh, and then, of course, by the wealthiest of the population, because of course we have more people with more money, of course, then they will spend more, they will consume more, and the only way that we can use in order to minimize the environmental impacts is to try to be more efficient, which is to say, to, be, to, cons to produce less pollution, say, per GDP, and to consume less resources per GDP. So this is, of course, a call for efficiency. And if it is like this, uh, my argument today will be that we need to look at economies as a metabolism. So an economy, uh, and this will provide, I believe, the perfect uh, and the coherent uh, framework between the economy and the environment and society. Because, of course, if we look at an economy, and if we look at the nature that, uh, in which the economy is embedded, we will have material flows of imports and domestic extraction. So we extract things from our space, geographical space. We import materials. We process them in a way that then we have a stock in the economy. And then, of course, we have exports and we provide domestic output, normally in the form of waste and other undesirable things like pollution. And this is the basis for what we call the material flow analysis. And of course, I'm an engineer, and this is the practitioner's view. So what I will do now is to go and to explore this, um, this idea and to say that uh, this is the graphic I always show because this changed my life from a normal mechanical engineering to something else that you will decide by yourself at the end of this talk. And this was a graph that I saw in 1998 and showed the evolution by the time uh, in a decade what happened to the economies in Europe. This is the GDP per capita evolution in 10 years and this is the direct material input uh, evolution. This is the direct material input was in this previous diagram the total in kilograms of the dogmatic extraction plus the imports. So the total amount of materials that an economy consumes over a year. And then you will see, not surprising, these three very special countries, even by the time, Portugal, Greece and Spain, going in a very different trajectory when compared to the other European countries. And this is very interesting. Because, of course, Portugal was, by the time, in this sense, very good old times. So we were increasing GDP a lot. And then, but we were also increasing a lot the consumption of materials. And then, the same with Greece and Spain. Eventually, we have, uh, eventually this showed that there was a magic pathway in which, when an economy needs to grow the GDP, it looks like it increases the material consumption up until a moment where it, it, uh, it was stabilized. And this was very intriguing to me. So is this an universal rule? It is always happening? What is this? And this was clearly 
trying to understand which was the model of development of modern economies. And then we started with this analysis, we published the paper by 2003, showing a very important diagram, in my opinion, which is, yes, it is true, this is an universal rule, and a very worrying one. So this curve showed to have statistical uh, validity, which shows that an economy, for example, like China by the time or so, if they are growing to increase GDP, they are growing to increase material consumption proportionally until a magic number of about $15,000 per, per, per person uh, GDP where this tends to stabilize. Of course, it will never come down eventually, but at least it will stabilize. And of course, this was very important and this is very clearly a concern because of course material consumption is on the basis of environmental impacts, always, and as we know, the total uh, footprint, the ecological footprint by 1990 was already bigger than the earth available capacity. So of course if we are going to consume more, we need to be very, very concerned. And this was the motivation for me to start working on this by the time. At a certain time, and of course I did a lot of international studies on this, but then I thought, well, but if we want to be effective, if we want to change the world, what should we do? Where should we look at? And it is very clear that if we look to this diagram here, which shows urbanization in 1980, the colors mean that, for example, here the yellow shows that urbanization, which means that the percentage of people that live in cities in each country in the United States and in Europe were from 50 to 75 percent. In South America, already greater than 75 percent, but of, for example, in China, uh, less than 25 percent. And see, this was in 1980, this is in 1910, this is in 2010, and this will be in 2050, which clearly shows something that all of you know, that of course urbanization is growing a lot and more and more people are living in cities. So why are cities important? Because cities where people live and cities are the lighthouse of consumption. So whether we can use cities to decrease the consumption per capita or we are doomed in the terms of environmental uh, performance of the, the global system. So that's why this is important. And that is something that sustainable urbanism means. So to find ways to uh, be more effective in the way we consume resources. Because it is in the cities that this battle for sustainability, global sustainability, will be won or lost. So that's why this is so important. This graph is also very interesting and intriguing. So this is, again, one of those laws. It seems that all the laws are like this when we make... Uh, it's very easy that when you make GDP with something, it will plot a diagram like this. This is very interesting. It shows that across the world, when a country is increasing GDP, almost always this is connected with people coming to cities. Of course, this means going from primary to tertiary economy. But of course, this is also a concern. So it means like, uh, it's, it looks like that a country for reaching levels of GDP, about $15,000, the ones that we were speaking about before, we need to have over 60 to 70% of the people living in cities. And of course, this is also a little bit concerning in a way. So that's why we have the, um, the cities looking like this in the world. Now, because of this, and I really appreciate Professor Davoudi um, metaphor in a way, which I will of course now uh, foster here, um, I am a guy nowadays that works in something which we call industrial ecology, which, which is to say that we look at uh, economic systems, looking to them as to mimic uh, ecosystems. And uh, if we look uh, at the urban metabolism metaphor, of course this means that I think you have said a good city, so it needs to be in equilibrium, in equilibrium, needs to be diverse, needs to be circular, needs to be resilient, and, of course, this is a characteristic of an ecosystem. So, uh, the city should look like an ecosystem. The problem is that, of course, an ecosystem is powered by the sun, uh, as the decomposers closing the cycle, and as the DNA is keeping the memory of the system. The, the, our systems are not driven by the solar system, are driven by money, uh, and are very, of course, complex. For example, we need to have more recycling to close the, the, the material circles, uh, cycles. And of course, we need more education, culture, and interaction uh, to keep memory and to become more efficient. So, and this is, of course, my faith. So that uh, if we don't know what to do in any moment of time, please let's look at the natural systems and try to take some lessons. 
So this will be another talk. It's not the talk of today. So um, this is only to say that I could say something more philosophical as well, not so much, but today I'll be practitioner, practitioner. So what I would try to do in my research uh, since uh, my, all my life until three months ago when I would join, of course, the, the Science Foundation, um, was to develop mechanisms and methods to quantify this anywhere in the world, making use of available data, because this is always a very big problem. I want to quantify the urban me metabolism anywhere in the world. And then, of course, this was very interesting. This was the PhD thesis of, uh, well, Samuel Nies and then Leonardo Rosado. And we really developed the method that was based, for example, in ConAccount, which, uh, uh, which is a statistical database which, which calculates all the, all the imports and exports in terms of products across the world. This was based in input-output tables, which any national statistical device develops based on the economy. And then, on something which was terrible for the student, on the material composition of more than 13,000 products, because of course then we need to transform products in their material constituents. So uh, we need also to know the lifespan of the, of the products, and then of course uh, if the product was in terms of was being produced, was being disposed, etc. So we developed this mathematical uh, formulation which helped to, to account for this. And then, of course, we need to develop a standardization of the material products. And then, for example, we divide these in these main categories, fossil fuels, metals, non-metallic minerals, biomass and chemicals and fertilizers. And then in uh, 28 uh, subdivisions of materials which are represented here. And this was very important because if I want to calculate the urban metabolism, what does this mean? This means what the city eats. So how much does the city eat? How much does it get fed with the materials that it accumulates? And how much does it release in which form? In a useful form or in terms of residues and pollution and etc. And then as I will show you, we wanted to go a little bit more. And I guess that we were clearly pioneers doing this. We wanted not to know only what the city eats, but then which was the organ that was responsible by eating these things, which is to say, which was the economic sector which was responsible by consuming these materials, and how much added, level, added value in terms of money it generated with these materials, which is to say something which is nowadays very important. We were able to calculate resource productivity, urban resource productivity for each economic sector and for each material consumed in the city. This is, for example, the, the Lisbon material balance in aggregate terms. This was the first thing we did. So, for example, most of the materials that were consumed were accumulated in Lisbon, but the, most of the others were, of course, disposed as pollution problems. And you see, recycling is negligible. Of course, uh, we did this. We got a little bit famous by doing this, not too much, but enough for the Asian Development Bank to ask us to do something very crazy. Well, if you are so good doing this, we would like to showcase and ask you to do uh, the urban metabolism of six big Asian cities. And you will not visit the cities. So you really need to develop a method that is totally reliant on, um, on uh, public available data. And then you need to draw these for the cities. I got crazy for more than one year uh, because I went into a very crazy world of input-output economics, deriving a lot of algebraic formulation of input-output economics. I will not tell you about that. I have still nightmares uh, with this. But eventually we solved this, and we came up to this um, pathway, which goes from Ho Chi Minh. Oh, sorry. You can, this is available in the web. You can download this if you are interested. So this is, if you look ADB and Urban Metabolism of Six and Cities, you will get the PDF of this uh, diagram. And this takes us into a journey from Ho Chi Minh to Seoul. And then I have added here Lisbon and Paris just for comparison. So Ho Chi Minh, Manila, Bangalore, Shanghai, Seoul, and Bangkok. And then we have derived these beautiful diagrams, of which we are very proud. I need to say that once I presented this in Yale, and I was very happy because in the end a very famous professor came to me and said, well, this is, this is a great work. I was very proud. But they said, well, you know, I'm a professor at heart. And this is really beautiful. <laughs> so then I don't know if I was so happy or not. 
but so I will just try to explain. This is not more than a, 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 a round matrix. So that's what this is. So this could have been a matrix. But I think this is very interesting, although of course I'm very proud about this. What does this mean? From here to here, these are the materials that are consumed in a city, divided by the 28 categories of materials that I've shown before. And for example, so this is biomass. Uh, biomass one is agricultural biomass. For example, biomass eight, as you can see here, is unspecified. Um, here are the other materials. And this is the economic sectors which consumes those materials. So, for example, this is stock, growth, fi growth uh, fixed capital formation. This is final consumption. This is exports. And this is consumption by the economic sectors. Consumption by economic sectors is very bad because the sector does not consume. It means that this is waste. So this was consumption by the economic sectors that was not transformed in final consumption or export. So this is waste, really. And you see this is very nice because then you can see really the metabolism of a city. I call this the DNA of a city because you can really show how cities are different. Say, for example, this is Bangalore. Bangalore has a lot of... Can we help me reading this? So this has a lot of biomass, which is exported. And now I would like to show you, for example, just another one, which is Shanghai. Look clearly different. So this is non-metallic minerals that is accumulated in the city. What does this mean? Construction. So you see, you can clearly look at these urban metabolism maps and clearly see that cities are different and what I'm trying to do with this scientifically is to show that we have different city typologies. And this, this is a very good method to quantify city typologies. This will be, of course, another talk as well. But what I would like to show you, if you organize the cities by what they consume, you, clearly try to, you, can, you can clearly identify cities which have similar typologies. And this, of course, means this idea of Skansen that there are cities that, of course, are there are transport hubs, there are industrial cities, there are banking cities, there are commercial cities. And of course, this, uh, in, in the genes of the city, we'll have to do with how they transform the materials with, and which are the economic sectors that consume those materials. So, very clearly. Well, I've done this, and uh, since last year, I said, well, all of this is very beautiful, but what should I do with this? So, I can do wonderful diagnostics across the world, I can show why things are going well or bad. I can show, for example, if a city changes their economic pattern to a, from A to B, which will be the, the consequences for the environment, the consequences for the use of material resources, the, the consequences for the economic productivity. But since last year, together with MIT, yes, within the, since two years ago with MIT, we start to develop something that, of course, passions me. This work, uh, needless to say, is of course a multidisciplinary work. So it involves e economists, it involves engineers, and now it involves architects. So most of my PhD students nowadays are architects. And of course, um, I'm very happy and proud to say this because of course, I really like architects very much these days. And I will just to try, as you've seen, the presentation got much more beautiful. From now on, this was done by architects. So you will see the, the improve in quality of the presentation. Before it was done by me, now this is the architect's component. What we try to do is let us try to develop an architect tool that can be able to do urban planning, to, to be able to quantify all these flows, able to simulate different understandings of how we should design the city, and also able to use the tools that an architect already uses. So for example, all of this that you are going to see from now on was developed in Rhino. For architects, they will know very well what this is, in what is now this modern system of beams. Um, and we tried to, de we developed this tool to model the city of Lisbon. So we took the expo area as an example, and what I'm going to, to show you now very briefly, so is to see how it works. So we have, of course, the, the, we did, of course, something which is very critical. We modeled all and every single building in the area, thousands of buildings. This is very important. This is a full-scale tool, impressive in terms of mathematical re realization of this. We took all the buildings. We went to the statistics and we know 
for each of those buildings, which is the number of floors, which is the surface area, how many people live in them, uh, which is even the economic situation of uh, these people. Um, of course, there I need to say, we did this by the, the lowest, uh, the highest resolution uh, statistical representation, which normally involves more than one building, and then we need, for each building we need to assume that in that special representation the buildings, of course, are homogeneous, and then we organize by floor, etc. But we know, for example, how many people live in that because of that. And then I have another PhD student which is characterizing building typologies. So what we wanted to do, okay, so how many building typologies do we have in this region? We organize them basically by period of construction, and then if there are single family, multi-family, and then what type of building is isolated contiguous, and then we come to the, the most significant building typologies, which still, for example, in this area, cover more than 80% of the people that live in, those, in, in that place. So this is important. And then, of course, we went through with architects and engineers, and these are the building typologies, the real building typology in the expo area, and then we fully characterized them, quantifying in the BIM uh, system that is made available by the Rhino platform, all the materials that, the real, so we really designed the building, so all the construction materials with a lot of detail, uh, the geometry, of course, and then, of course, we ran at the same time we run uh, energy consumption models, so we are able to simulate the energy consumption in those, in those buildings. So this is really a fully fledged simulation, which I think is very impressive, and of course we are very proud of this, and I need to recognize the partnership with MIT, without this, this would be possible. So we are working with a group on building technologies at MIT and uh, IST. So this is the full detail, so I've, I know all the materials that are in these buildings, for example, so I can do my material flow analysis. I know where the windows are. The beautiful thing of working with BIM is that this is, uh, of course, a representation by parameters. So, uh, for example, I can take one window and put the other window. All the windows are immediately changed in the building. This means, for example, if I have a single glazed uh, window and I want to have a double one, I can immediately see which is the impact, for example, in material consumption. And now, what we are also trying to do is to look at, uh, so we have the energy model, I've already spoke about this, but we are looking also to integrate in this transportation model and, for example, food uh, consumption model. And something that we are doing, which I guess is innovative, and I would like, that's the only piece of this work that I would like to show you, is that we are even looking to, of course, now uh, we have a base model, so we have a, a base scenario, and of course we want to design a new scenario. And I will show you, for example, if you want to change the windows or if you want to put more insulation, the obvious things in energy management. But something that I want to show you, which is different now, is, ah, and then I am crazy about sliders. So I am the slider guy. So I like to have the capacity for someone which doesn't understand anything about this, just come here with the mouse and change the slide. This means, for example, you say, well, 45% of these buildings have this technology, or 10% or 20, which is the impact in all the material flows that are consumed and processed in that area. What I would like to show you, we are now working on a case study, so another PhD student, which is very advanced on this. We are studying, well, you know, we want food resilience, for example. Uh, what if there is a problem in supplying a city? Why don't we try to use the top floor to produce vegetables? making use of hydroponic systems. And we have, again, made a full model of this. And uh, what we are doing, this is the full model made from the architect. Of course, I will. Well, I took some course on this at MIT. So I, I not promised I can do this so beautiful and so fast. But nowadays, I do understand this better. So this is really the, um, the rooftop uh, with a greenhouse with different level of hydroponic systems to produce lettuce, for example. And then, what we are saying is that, for, what we concluded is that with this system, for example, this can produce lattices that will, be, that will fully provide three buildings like this in the neighborhood. So, for example, if you want one for lettuce, another for tomato, another for this, this could be uh, providing all the food required, all the food, no, all the vegetables requiring uh, for the neighborhood, for example. Of course, I am also an, an LCA person, life cycle assessment, and of course what we are doing is quantifying is this better for the environment that, than the traditional one? The answer is yes. But this will also be able to eventually change something which is very important, which is the behavior of the people. 
Of course, something which is very key to sustainability is that people change behavior. So we need, for example, in Lisbon to become more, again, more uh, uh, happy with the Mediterranean diet. Changing the diet is, of course, absolutely critical, and we need to eat more vegetables. If we have them handy, eventually this will change things. And then, of course, we have made all the life cycle assessment to calculate. This is already published in a recent paper in the Journal of Cleaner Production. And this is the, the aspect, the, is the, how the, the simulation tool looks nowadays, looks like nowadays. So we have the, the full scale modeling, and then we can change the different uh, uh, parameters that we selected. And then this tells you how much this change, for example, in energy consumption, water consumption, food consumption, goods and services, etc. And of course, then it changed the colors here on the, the each building, how much it was affected. Well, this was basically my last slide. So my conclusions are certainly in the perspective of a practitioner, so very, very evidently that if we understand, we quantify, and we can make informed choices. And this is very important. But of course, I believe that the most, top, the most important thing, and that, that, that's why I really do value uh, this uh, seminar, is that it is the time uh, for us to bring different disciplines together. So, of course, the, the urban metabolism framework is nothing else than a, a framework that provides some bridges to uh, bring together different films, fields like the urban planners, the architects, the engineers, the ecologists eventually, and then having them working together with a very, very important uh, purpose, which is of course to contribute to a sustainable urbanism. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are a little bit late, so we are going to have time for some questions. And anyone wants micro? Thank you. Um, I'm Present yourself, please. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, Agatino Rizzo, uh, Lulio University of Technology in Sweden. I very much enjoyed these two presentations and uh, these two uh, very powerful metaphors. Of course, uh, it is very obvious the limitations, especially like in, uh, in, the late, uh, in the latest metabolism uh, where there are lots of variables, but perhaps the most significant one and is also the most difficult to model is politics and urban politics and what's missing. And uh, similar like to uh, Simmons' presentation also is a limitation also of uh, uh, resilience. But my question for, for you is, uh, so uh, what's the way forward in resilience if there is any? Is it going to be like a, a resilience, uh, a, a vogue, like a vogue, like a term like sustainability as it looks like? Uh, or do you think there is a way forward for it? or? Uh, if you can elaborate. Maybe, maybe more one question for each other. Oh, please. Uh. Um, can I ask uh, Paul Frohn uh, if he is thinking or if he has already uh, applied into these models the, the transports component? Um, because I think it's uh, a city is basically uh, stocks and flows. Uh, this is, was very much oriented towards stocks. Now look at flows. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. This is Maria Rosario Partidario. IST Lisbon. I really appreciate both uh, presentations. Um, I'm here. <laughs> um, I really appreciate, and it, it really shows uh, exactly the, um, the dichotomy that we see in resilience approaches. Uh, Paul Frein approaches very much the engineering perspective, also looking into sustainability in a very quantitative way. 
very pragmatic, very engineering, while Simin is, is, uh, is addressing, well, the resilience in a way that resonates a lot to me as well. Um, interestingly, about two weeks ago, I, um, I gave a keynote speech in the International Association for Impact Assessment annual conference exactly on the issue of resilience and sustainability. So it's quite a coincidence. And I find very interesting many of the, the issues that you, you address, including the issue of the, what we call bad resilience. So the fact that resilience is not only about excellent, wonderful improvements, it may be, all, in fact, very, very dangerous to maintain and to persist with some systems that may lead uh, to actually uh, very unsustainable situations. Um, I have one comment for Simini and, uh, and one question. Comment is, uh, relates to your first sentence and quotation from the New York Times. Uh, Time for resilience, stop thinking about sustainability. Well, in my keynote speech I addressed the connection between the two. So I don't think there is a choice between resilience or sustainability. I think that resilience is instrumental to achieve sustainability. So um, I, I'm not sure what you think about this. I, I realize that you've been writing, writing about that a lot, but I'm curious about uh, what is your perspective. And the, the, the question is, um, I find myself daily in an engineering context because I'm, I'm an engineer myself and I am a professor at an engineering school. And, and the, the pragmatism and the dependence and the demands on very linear, quantified, exact situations excludes tremendously the dimension of value, the social dimension, and, how, uh, and the difficulty that you have exactly expressed between the ecological approach, very consequential, uh, very expectable, and the social approach, which is completely non expectable So how would you advise us uh, to address the, uh, this current mentality, and uh, not so much in terms of neoliberalism, but more in terms of engineering thinking? Thank you. Thank you, Rosalia. I give the... Okay. Thank you, yes, yes, thank you very much for the, for the questions. Um, let me see, uh, what well, the first question was about the way forward, and uh, I, I, I'm sorry, every time I do this presentation, I'm, I'm afraid I do it more often than I wish to do, um, I do get a comment that it's a bit of a doom and gloom. Um, with, uh, with the way I present the notion. I'm, I'm, and in, in doing that, I'm just trying to encourage people to be vigilant about these sort of concepts that suddenly land on our desks and uh, present to us as uh, universally applicable everywhere and universally good. So that is really the real intention in, 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 in my argument that we have to be vigilant about these uh, concepts. In terms of the way forward, um, sorry. In, in terms of the way forward, um, I think the way for, in order to explore the way forward, I think we, we need to look into complexity theory, which is the foundation of this resilience thinking. And I think it is the most fascinating uh, sort of development in science and has certainly important implication for social science and humanities. So I suppose it is there that as social scientists, we need to think about, and the, probably the biggest challenge facing us is that if we agree that there are things that we do not know, and the reason that we do not know is not because we don't have enough knowledge, which was the view in the 60s and 70s, but because they are unknowable, because of inherent unpredictability. It's a logical impossibility, not an epistemic impossibility. So if we agree 
with that. Then the challenge, especially for planners who are trained to think about the future and to steer and to govern the future, the challenge for us is that how do we do that? If our forecasts are constantly wrong, if you like, what do we do? Is the way, the, the traditional way of governing our institutional framework and structures are suitable for addressing and governing an inherently unpredictable future? I certainly believe, and, and I suppose I tried to argue for that, that yes, yes, there is a scope because of our, when I say our, I mean human, and human not as necessarily as individuals, but as, as communities and as society, because of our agency and conscious intentions, there is a scope to steer things. But we should really forget our ideas of being able to control and command the future and order it. Because the idea of self-organization is, is true, it is real, and it happens. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't do anything about it. We can still steer things to the path which, as a society, we believe is the desirable path as a society, not as defined by a particular group of people. And I think that is where the politics, the power, the, um, come, and the normative questions are actually then come in, which I think it links sort of um, back to the question that you're uh, asking. What should be the outcome of resilience? Sustainability, I agree with that. That could be. I mean, as you, you probably know better than I do, there is a lot of debate and literature about the relationship between resilience and sustainability, and there are different perspectives on it. But if we take your perspective, which is sustainability as the outcome of a resilience system, then the question turns into how do we define sustainability? And if we define sustainability in terms of putting the emphasis on environment, on the kind of stuff that Paolo was talking about, about sort of environmental issues. And if we put the emphasis on social justice, then I think we can all sign up to that as a desirable outcome. But if we, if we define sustainability in the way that many people do, and they just use the sustainability and fill it in with whatever their agenda or strategies are, then I think we need to challenge. We need to challenge those definition of sustainability. Um, I suppose um, the engineering thinking, by the way, I have a lot of respect for engineers. <laughs> so if I talk about the engineering perspective, it's not necessarily to say that it's inferior to other perspectives. I'm just trying to say there are different perspectives. And that kind of engineering perspectives on, on the particular issue of resilience, which is about persistence of the system, is actually quite useful. You do not want to walk on a bridge that is not persistent, you know, and changes every minute. We had a wobbly bridge in London, and we had to do something, and the picture on my slide was the wobbly bridge. Um, so, you know, there, there, is, there is a scope for all these perspectives, sorry, in resilience. But as, as long as we know that how we then interpret this in the social context and be very careful that these notions of resilience are not hijacked by a particular agenda. I believe that in certain um, sort of um, corners of the political life, they are being hijacked. So self-organization if you, if you accept complexity, you have to accept the idea of self-organization. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you then translate that into self-reliance, and then you use that to take away the welfare state, to the government's support for communities, for individuals at times of hardship. 
and to tell them that to be resilient, you have to stand on your own feet. I think these are the aspects of it that we just have to be very vigilant and constantly challenge and constantly contest. That probably sums up my, my, the message from, from what I was trying to say. Thank you very much, Simon. Professor Bafahov. I'll be very brief, and uh, thank you for that question. So, yes, indeed, so we have in these models uh, the people from transportation, which basically are developing a model, uh, an OD model, so origin destination model, which has two major uh, implications. So one is, of course, for the traffic. So it, uh, it is able to simulate, for example, you put, if you put a high-rise building with a lot of people, what are the implications for the traffic? And it has another one, which is, for, particularly for me, very important, which is, for example, if you change to electrical cars, which is the implication for the electrical network, because this will put a lot of more um, pressure in the electricity cons in consumption in buildings where they, are, uh, where they are charged. And this is, of course, the beautiful, the beautiful thing of having these integrated models so that you can see the implications of changing in one dimension to the all the other dimensions. So yes, we have a team working on that. And this is, of course, a very important component of the whole simulator. Thank you very much. We are in late. Um, maybe we can short, uh, we have a short coffee break, 10 minutes. But uh, obviously, uh, I have to thank, again, in the name of the local organization committee, uh, to, to the two keynote speakers. And thank you very much.